welcome back to the glioblastoma, aka GBM podcast. I'm your host, Amber Barback, the founder and director of the Glioblastoma Research Organization. Before we kick off this week's episode, which is called Being Your Best Advocate, I want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors at Xcures and share with you a little bit more about what they're doing. Xcures is a platform that combines all of your medical records in 15 minutes and your information well structured to help support decisions along every step of the way. So what does that mean? One, it means you have centralized medical record access. It basically consolidates all of your medical records from different healthcare institutions and puts them in one place because especially with the glioblastoma diagnosis, you might want to get a second opinion and you might want to go elsewhere than where you're currently being seen. And so with using X-Cures, you basically have all your information in one place and no matter where you go, all the doctors and medical providers will be able to access your healthcare chart. It also uses AI technology, which means that tool is extracting vital medical information from your chart and making it stand out. X-Cures also empowers informed decision making, facilitates future research and development, and streamlines patient and physician collaboration. And you can learn more by visiting our website, gbmresearch.org, or going directly to xcures.com. So let's get into this week's episode talking about advocacy. Advocacy is not easy. I did not know what advocacy was when my dad had brain cancer. And the fact that I did not know that a couple years ago is mind-blowing to me. And looking at just the world of cancer and brain cancer now, thinking about not being able to advocate yourself blows my mind. So today I'm going to share with you everything I've learned over the last five years since starting the organization, talking about advocacy, how you can advocate for yourself, how you can advocate for your loved one. And so you are the most informed and best equipped to deal with any situation that comes your way during your brain cancer diagnosis. So the first thing is, what is my role as a caregiver? Your role as a caregiver is to advocate for your loved one. Oftentimes when someone's in the hospital, It's extremely overwhelming. They're being seen by many different providers, different physicians. There's just, there's so much going on. And that person's first thought is not how can I advocate for myself? So you as someone that's coming into the hospital, that's going with them to the appointments, your job is to make sure that you are advocating for them. So what does advocacy mean? Advocacy means getting all the information from the doctors. For example, when my mom was going through surgery with my dad, she was in the waiting room. She was by herself. Again, I was in Spain. I didn't know any of this was going on, but my mom is by herself in the waiting room and the doctor comes out and he's like, your husband has glioblastoma. Again, she's by herself. She's like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? I, I, you know, he didn't tell her anything. And so in that situation, advocacy is like, excuse me, Mr. Doctor, (laughs) whoops first of all you're going to take more than 10 seconds to sit down with me you're going to explain to me this diagnosis you're going to do your job you're going to tell us what exactly this diagnosis is what that looks like what treatment options are and you are going to advocate for information you should not accept anything less than being given information you should not be just told to google something which is something that my mom dealt with you should be able to talk to your provider and understand exactly what this diagnosis is. And if they don't have the pathology yet, you should be able to say, okay, you know, the doctor should be able to tell you, okay, it's going through pathology right now. We have a radiologist that's going to be looking at it. You know, this is what it might look like. You should get as much information as you possibly can and you should not take no for an answer. And during this time, you're going to want to take notes. You should be taking notes of what the doctor is saying. You know, if he mentions any particular treatment, any particular drug, if he mentions any special cancer center, any specialized treatment, if he mentions a clinical trial, anything that comes out of that doctor's mouth, you should be writing down because in that moment, it's very overwhelming. Odds are you don't really, you're not going to remember what's going on in the moment, but taking those notes, maybe you're like recording on your phone with permission or whether you're, again, like you're literally just writing notes down in your phone on a piece of paper, whatever it is, to be able to go back and reference that later is going to be extremely valuable. So let's move into advocacy in regards to clinical trials. There are a million clinical trials out there. So a lot of people ask, how do I know what clinical trial is going to work? There are so many different options. How do I know what is right for my person, whether it's myself, my loved one, doesn't matter. How do I pick one? There are so many options. The first thing is, is to talk to your doctor. Actually rewind. I think the first thing is, is to make sure you're comfortable with your doctor. A lot of times people will not want to ask for certain medical records to say, hey, I want to get a second opinion from elsewhere. And some doctors might get upset at that. If your doctor is a good doctor, they're not going to get upset at that. A lot of times you might hear a referral from someone else and say, hey, I want to go to this institution. You might not just get like a great vibe from the person you're dealing with. And if someone's going to be treating you for a very serious cancer, if you're going to have surgery, someone's going to cut your head open, 
if you're going to be dealing with someone, you know, for the rest of your life and going to different appointments and treatment, you want to be comfortable with your provider. You want to trust them and you want to have a good relationship where you can say, okay, I trust this person with my life. If you don't feel that with your doctor, you should look elsewhere. There is nothing wrong with getting a second opinion at all. And if someone makes you feel bad for wanting to get a second opinion, that is your sign that that person is probably not the right fit for you. So then to the next step, you find the doctor you like, you like a center, you know, you, you find the place where you feel most comfortable. How do you know what clinical trials work? The first thing is, is going to be talking with your doctor, especially with something like glioblastoma. There are a lot of different types. There's methylated, there's unmethylated, there's different mutant, there's wild type. Every single clinical trial has different criteria to enter the trial. Whether it's your first time getting diagnosed or whether you have a recurrent brain tumor, every single situation is different. And that's why it's so important to talk to your doctor because your doctor knows what the clinical trial criteria are. They know your medical history and they can say, you know, we're going to look at your DNA. We can look at exactly what it is that you're doing, what your tumor looks like, and we can say, hey, this treatment might be the best option for you. That being said, there are so many different resources online, and it's very likely that if you go searching for clinical trial options, you might find something. You might go onto different nonprofit organization websites and say, you know, see a list of different clinical trials that are being offered. You might just go through clinicaltrials.gov. You might hear something talked in a Facebook page. There are so many different ways that someone can hear about a trial that might be enrolling. And it's okay to say, you know, hey, doctor, I heard about XYZ trial. It's enrolling at XYZ institution. Does this work for me? I'm hearing really great things. And you have to remember that not every single clinical trial is going to be available at every single institution. There are certain trials that are done at certain sites there are some trials that work within like a site group so you really just it depends and there are so many different options but that's why talking to your doctor will be able to one pinpoint the trial that's best for you and see what makes sense another option might be like let's say you hear a name of a drug company that's doing a certain trial some people will go directly to the company sometimes they do have public contacts where you know you can contact the company it might be a lot more costly it really just depends and I think it's circumstantial but there are always people that you can talk to to start getting second opinions and to figure out what's the best route for you. And even then within those drug companies, they have like a scientific advisory board. So sometimes, so there will be a certain situation where you might have to send in your medical records and they might be able to assess if their drug is right for you. It is hard though, because there are so many different treatment options. But again, talking to your doctor is going to be the best case scenario. And when you're working with a doctor that you're comfortable with, you will collectively come to the best decision for you and for your treatment plan. But again, that's not to say you can't advocate for yourself and say, hey doctor, I've heard of XYZ drug, XYZ trial. Can you tell me more about it and what does it mean? A question came in and it said, what are questions that I can ask my neuro-oncologist? So we've gone ahead and compiled a list based on feedback from our community and I'm going to read it here. So if you'd like to pause and take notes, this is a good time. Question one that you should ask your oncologist. What type and stage of cancer do I have? In regards to brain cancer, are there any mutilations? Are there any different markers or any special biomarkers that you can tell me about what it is that I have? Number two, what are my treatment options? Aside from standard of care, are there any opportunities for me to get involved in clinical trials? And are there any opportunities for me to do anything else aside from the standard of care? Third question is, what is the standard of care? And understand what those drugs are and what they do and how that works and how long your doctor and medical team would like you to be on the standard of care. Something that I also found important to ask was, what does the standard of care look like? Is my dad going to be sick? What can I bring with him to the hospital? What is going to make his hospital visit better? If he's having surgery, what can we bring them to make them feel more comfortable? Pack a hospital bag. It's good to understand just literally anything that you might need to make a checklist of to help make their experience better as well as yours. You know, you might be staying overnight. You might have to pack some overnight bags. They're just... It's good to understand what the next couple days look like, especially if you're going into the hospital. Another important one is how is the treatment going to impact daily life for myself and my loved ones? So understanding what they're going to be like after surgery, what symptoms they might have. And the next question is, what are things that I should look out for at home? So when you go home after being at the hospital, whether it's from surgery, whether it's from treatment, the doctor is not going to be with you. And most doctors will provide you a 24-hour number and will be able to remain in contact with you. But it's very, very important to understand if there are any signs and symptoms that you should look out for while you're at home in case you need to call someone if you're having a medical emergency. Another extremely important one that I don't think people ask enough is what supportive services does the institution have? Whether you're a hospital, whether you're a cancer center, whether you're a private practice, 
every single institution will have its own different support systems, whether you're a patient or a caregiver. And in this question, it's important to ask, what are caregiver resources that you can provide to me? And what are patient resources that you can provide? Typically all will offer a social worker to some extent. And the social worker is so incredibly helpful. And I wish people utilized social workers more often because they help with counseling. They help with advocacy. They help with assessment. They help with case management. They have supportive services, child welfare, and crisis intervention. So a social worker is going to be your best resource. They're going to be able to provide you information. They might be able to outsource information for either a palliative care or hospice center. They might be able to provide information for at-home nurses. They might be able to provide different support for like, how can I as a caregiver, you know, support my mental health? What apps can I use? What different treatment options are there? So if you have the opportunity to ask these questions, make sure you're asking one about a social worker and on both sides for patient and caregiver, how you can best be supported and you can use their services because they are literally there to help you. What are questions you can ask a neurosurgeon before you go into surgery? I think this depends on everyone. I personally like to know every single thing that a doctor is going to do to me if it was my in my particular situation. I cannot not know anything. There are some people that ignorance is bliss and they don't want to know anything they know they have to have brain surgery they're like okay put me under do what you got to do and I'm gonna wake up that's it for me if it was me I would ask what kind of surgery where are you cutting how big is the incision going to be what kind of anesthesia are you doing how long am I going to be under anesthesia what kind of anesthesia am I going to have effects after anesthesia how is it going to be waking up am I going to remember anything am I going to feel anything what else those were literally off the top of my head. Like these are actually questions that I would ask my doctor. It's important to ask about the recovery time. What can you do to help better recover? Are there things that you should not do in recovery time? Are there things that you should avoid? Are you are there things that you can do to better speed up the recovery process? Are there any natural things that you can do to help speed up the recovery process? Are there medications you can take? What if you're in pain? What do you do? What are some signs and symptoms you should look out for post-surgery? What if you're feeling X, Y, Z? When do I know when to come to the hospital again? What if there is an issue? How do I know if I'm healing properly? Is it going to leave a scar? How can I best help the scar? What can I put on the scar to make sure it doesn't scar as badly? Am I going to feel like something's missing in my head? I mean, these... There are so many different questions that you can ask. And again, I really just think it depends on if you're someone that's going to undergo brain surgery, what do you want to know? What do you care about? But also as a caregiver, you know, you might want to ask the doctor these questions. Let's say the patient themselves doesn't really care and, you know, they just want to get it done. They have to do what they have to do. But if it brings you comfort, you should absolutely do what is comfortable for you. And because at the end of the day, going through brain surgery, again, I've never experienced it, but as far as my dad, if I was there, these are all questions that I absolutely would have asked because for me, I like to be prepared for any possible situation. But again, it really just depends on what works for you and your family. Another question is, how do I know if I'm making the right choice for my loved one? That's something that's always going to be difficult because there's always going to be different outcomes for whatever situation that you might go through. I heard this quote the other day, actually not the other day, it was it was a while ago, but I kind of like to live on this wavelength is that there's no wrong decision. There's just a, the best decision for you at one time. And I think a lot of people might experience guilt in regards to brain cancer because let's say, you know, you and your loved one talk about going on a specific clinical trial and like, let's say it doesn't work. There might be some amount of guilt of like, oh, like I was really advocating for this clinical trial and now I feel bad because maybe they're not doing so well. And again, that situation can be replayed in so many different ways. But I think it's important to understand that you are all doing your best no matter what position you're in, whether you're a patient, a caregiver, medical advisor, and you are making the best decision for the patient at that time and for yourself at that time. And you're taking all the knowledge you have to be able to make a proper decision. So again, that's why it's important to advocate and get answers to all of these questions so you can make the most informed decision for your situation. But it's also important to recognize that beating yourself up at the end of the day if something doesn't go the way that you expected it to, that's going to do more harm than good because again, it's just about being prepared, asking the right questions and making the most informed decision but I think again if we all knew we could predict the future we wouldn't be dealing with like what 90% of life struggles I wish someone could just be like this is xyz and you have to just follow this path and there's nothing else to do and everything's going to be great but unfortunately it's not like that so being able to get all the right answers 
or being able to just get answers to the questions and then making the most informed decision to where you feel comfortable and you stick by your decision that's what's going to be best and I think also too like in your gut you might have a feeling of like okay I feel comfortable with this if something feels really really wrong there's a good chance that that's not the right decision but if you feel like okay we're confident in this decision we're making this decision as a family as a team including our doctor including your doctor including your doctor at the end of the day we're all just doing our best you know like a similar situation for me that I can reference back to this is that when my dad was in hospice and I was in New York and this was what two days before he passed away and the hospice center called me and they're like do you want us to put your dad on oxygen and water um and I was like the fact that I have to make this decision is the absolute worst decision of my entire life but I look back to a conversation I had had with my dad and you know when I was younger and he was like the, the moral of the story was is that if he was ever in a position where he was just bedridden and was just unable to function as a human, he didn't want to be around anymore. And so in my mind, I was taking his wishes and I was like, you know, you guys can give him oxygen, but he doesn't need to be on an IV. Uh, you know, he didn't want his life to be prolonged and that's what my dad wanted and I had to make that judgment call. And that was extremely hard. And at the end of the day, I still always think about, did I make the right choice? Maybe if I had put him on an IV, I could have actually said, like, I could have actually been there when my dad passed away. But again, I'm never going to know. And in that decision, I made the right decision to where I knew it was what my dad would have wanted. And I, I didn't feel comfortable making the decision, but I knew it's the, I knew in that moment it was the right decision. And I felt at peace with the decision that I was making because it's what he would have wanted. So it's just thinking about you and your loved one and your family, maybe referencing back to different conversations you've had. And again, just coming collective together as a team and being able to make a judgment call that is best for you. And one last question to wrap up the episode is what if I know what's best for my loved one and they don't agree? Then I don't think you know what's best. At the end of the day, every person should be able to make their own decisions and they are in charge of their own life and you are not in charge of someone's life unless you're given power of attorney and that's a whole different conversation. But at the end of the day, it's you don't want someone to dictate how you would live your life. And so why is it fair to your loved one for you to think that you know what's best for them? They know what's best. They're a human being. They're given as much privilege as you are. They're on this earth. They're living. They're breathing. They are in charge of their own life and they have the capacity to know what is best for them. And so as a caregiver, sometimes you might think that they're making the wrong decision. But as a loved one, you have to understand that people are in charge of their own lives. And sometimes you have to just sit back and say, okay, like, I love you. I support you. I'm here for you. And I'm with you. We've got this. I'm on your team. We're going to do this together. And sometimes that's all you have to say. And again, it's sometimes it's hard. You might think that they're wrong. But again, it's imagine someone that wanted to dictate your life just because of whatever situation you were in it's not really fair and people do know what is best for them and people should be making the decisions that they feel comfortable with because it is their life so again I think that's also a tricky a tricky topic too but I just like to put myself in that situation what I want someone telling me how I should live my life and the answer is no and so again like with my dad too I thought there was a few decisions that he could have made differently but again it's it's not it's not my judgment call so I hope this episode was able to help anyone that might be having any questions in relation to advocacy this holiday season I know it's not easy brain cancer is not something that's easy especially it gets harder as holiday season comes around so hopefully this provides some support for whatever situation you're going through and again Please contact your medical provider or healthcare team with any questions in relation to anything in this episode. And again, if you want to get in contact with the organization, you can contact us at contact at gbmresearch.org. So with that, happy almost holidays, and I will see you all next episode. Mm -hmm.